Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this lecture, I will discuss about the applications of bioinformatics right, in computer drug design. We have studied about various techniques in bioinformatics using sequences and the structures and also we discussed about various types of interactions and how this information can be used to identify the lead molecules or the probable inhibitors right, for any specific targets. Because in the current scenario, it is very important for the development of drugs because it takes about 10 years so from the beginning to come to the market and many lead compounds they fail and various different clinical trials. Right? In this case, it is very important to have a set of uh, molecules right? or could be a lead compounds right? for the initial start. So, I will discuss different techniques for example, the docking and the virtual screening and quantity structure activity relationship right, to identify the probable uh, inhibitors right, generally used in computer drug design. In the last few classes, we discussed about the proteins, protein folding rates, protein stability and protein interactions and specifically last class we discussed about the protein interactions. Right, what are different types of complexes? Protein protein complexes, protein nucleic acid complexes, protein carbohydrate complexes and protein ligand complexes. Right. And all these complexes they are important for several functions, right. So, and we can identify the binding sites or the interface residues for any complex. So, we discussed about three different criteria to identify the binding sites. What are three different criteria we discussed? Distance based criteria, distance based criteria, change in based on solvent accessibility, energy as well as interaction energy, right. And using this information, we are identified some residues which are preferred to be the binding sites and the binding partners. Right, between two proteins, there are some residue pairs are preferred and they are involved in different types of interactions. Right, we discussed about three different types of interactions. Right, what are different types of interactions we discussed? Aromatic aromatic interactions right, and cut and pie interactions and leptostatic interactions. Right. Then to understand the importance of these interactions, we need to see whether the mutation of these specific residues at the binding interface change or alter the binding affinity right with the respect to other residues. So, we discussed about a database right called the approximate right which contains information regarding the binding affinity upon mutations right. This could be useful resource right for any researchers to understand the binding affinity right of any protein protein complexes upon mutations. So, when you go to the protein ligand interactions right. So, what do you mean by ligand? What is the meaning of ligand? Generally, we can say any small molecules, right? Ligands are small molecules, or you can see any substance or any chemical compound, right? It can be a drug or any function group that point specifically to any other entity to make a complex. For example, a small molecule that can interact with a protein, like a protein ligand complex, or this drug molecule can interact with the DNA, like the DNA drug interactions, and so on. Here is one example this aspirin. What is aspirin? Right, yeah, this is a painkiller, right? So in that case, uh, if you have a headache, then you can use to, uh, have this aspirin, right? Uh, uh, this can say uh, is this a drug. So if you do the look at the protein ligand binding, so you have protein and you have ligand. The if they they binds, the ligand is usually a signal triggering molecule because this will go and attach with the packet in the protein, right? And this will trigger, right, at the at the at the binding site. So why are this will target? Right, at the protein that site that is called the binding site right in a target protein. So, I show this uh, ligand binding to any receptor or any protein right, it changes the conformation of the protein because protein has any specific conformation as it is. Then when the ligand or a small molecule they, they interact with any packet right, this will change the conformation right. And this will also make to have the interaction between the protein as well as the ligand. This ligand can be a substrate or this can be a inhibitors or activators as well as neurotransmitters. Then how strong or what is the tendency of this specific ligand 
to interact with the protein right that tendency or the strength is called the affinity. So, we see affinity of a ligand. So, what is the meaning of the affinity of a ligand? The strength of binding. The strength of the binding right how far this ligand can interact with the protein, protein molecule right that will give you the affinity. So, if it is high affinity what is the meaning of that? Tightly bound. It is tightly bound right, like compared to low affinity. So, if you have several uh, compounds, then we can identify these different affinities of each compound, then you can find the specificity right among these different uh, small molecules which one has the best preference right to interact with a particular protein. So, if you see here ligand, generally it can be described with the lipin 6 root of 5 right, right. We can see if you see all the rules and all the rules are the multiples of 5. So, there are 4 rules and all the multiples of 5. So, here this is uh, Lipin C stated these rules for a drug for a ligand to be kind of for correct of drug likeliness right. Not necessarily all the drugs should have should follow this criteria, but most of the drugs right or any chemical compound which may act as a drug likeliness they may have this type of uh, uh, conditions. The first one is the molecular weight. So, what is the molecular weight? You can see the any compound, you can see the weight, right? The molecular weight should be less than 500 daltons. Then we have the hydrogen bond acceptor, the less than 10, and hydrogen bond donor, less than 5. What the difference between hydrogen bond acceptor and hydrogen bond donor? How to discriminate hydrogen bond acceptor and hydrogen bond donor? So, hydrogen? Yeah, hydrogen bond attached, hydrogen attached with the electronegative atom, that is called hydrogen bond donor, right? Which one receives this one, that is called the acceptor. Then the hydrophobicity that is mentioned as octanal water partition coefficient right, that is not greater than 5. So, we have the hydrophobic, so it is not be uh, not greater than 5. So, now if you have this is the characteristic features of ligands. Now, when they try to interact right you can see a protein here, if we look at the protein. So, you can see a pocket here right. So, this is a pocket this you can say a uh, kind of cavity this is uh, probably a binding site. So, if you the ligand tries to goes near to this protein right maybe for example here this is the ligand okay, this make the complex. So, you have protein protein has a binding site right and the ligand can go uh, uh, to the binding site and you can interact and make finally make the complex. Here you have to think about two different aspects one is the pose right. So, you have the cavity right acting as a binding site what is the pose of this particular cavity what is the conformation of that particular binding site. Depending on the conformation then the ligand can have different uh, efficiencies right. If it is fit well then it can tightly interact right in this case the affinity is very high right or if it does not fit well then in this case the affinity is less. So, one is the pose the conformation of that particular uh, binding site and the second one you can see the binding affinity we can uh, relate in terms of a score which will give you the strength of the binding. So, two different aspects one is the binding site or the pose and the second thing is the scoring. So, what is the meaning of binding site or a pose right. Here you can see this is the part of the protein where the ligand binds. In this figure you can see here this is the place where the ligand, ligand can probably bind right. So, this you can say as the uh, binding site and generally this kind of a cavity on a protein surface right because this, uh, the interior part is highly covered and they are mainly importing the stability of the protein. In this case you can see generally type of cavity right on the protein surface. Then how to identify these active sites right. So, generally if you look at the crystal structure of a protein right bind to this any known inhibitor and if you take the inhibitor you can see there is a cavity right where the ligand bound with this protein. So, you can look at this structures you can see this binding sites and also lot of several computer programs available right? in this case you can give the PDB structure right you can identify the uh, binding site of any particular protein right. The second thing is the binding mode right what is different by binding mode this will give you the scoring right. So, we need the binding site then the second one we need the binding mode or the pose and based on that the ligand can bind and we can score whether the ligand can properly fit or not. So, what is the binding mode or the pose this will give you the geometry of the ligand right in the binding site. So, geometry is terms as location orientation as well as the conformation right you can see both in the case of the protein site as well as the ligand site. Ligand site also you can change the conformation and make various conformations right. For example, if I see uh, you show this ligand 
this one conformation. During these translation rotations, we can change several conformation of this particular ligand. Then you can see whether this ligand can fit with this binding site, right? Fine. So now we have the protein. The protein we identified the binding site, and we have the ligand. Ligand we can also generate. We can different conformations. Now the next aspect is whether these two will interact, or how far this pose of these different ligands they can fit with the binding site, right? For this we use the term docking. Right. What is the, what is the meaning of generally docking? Um, it is again the interaction between the two molecules, right? You dock between the two molecules, so the, for example, the protein as well as the ligand. So, what, what the docking does? So, docking generally tries to find the best match. If you have a protein as well as a ligand, it will try to interact with the uh, particular site with the best match. For example, you can see any protein protein complexes or the protein uh, ligand complexes or the protein DNA complexes right it is a kind of lock and key mechanism right? you can see a shape complementarity right. For example, if you have uh, a binding site like this and if the here you can see the binding sites right then you can find the ligand which right you can see to accept right to interact with that particular place like the shape of the shape complementarity right. So, find the best match right. So, then if you do like this what will happen the orientation changes which maximizes the interaction between the protein and the ligand and minimizes the total energy of the complex. In this case it is it gives a strength of binding right you can see various examples like protein uh, nucleic acids, protein ligand, protein protein and so on. So, this binding is very important and based on the strength of these interactions you can uh, relate with the activity of the compounds and this plays an important role in the structure based drug design to identify the lead compounds right to identify the inhibitors right for any uh, specific targets right which are uh, involved in this different pathways or the, uh, in different diseases fine. So, how the term structure based drug design emerged how they started to identify some compounds and how they related these small molecules or ligands right to, uh, to interact with the proteins in the discovery of the structure based drug design. Earlier days they tried to check the drugs by trial and error methods right from the ancient days if they are sick they, they take some leaves right and they eat some of the leaves even uh, nowadays right certain so many medicinal uh, compounds right. So, mainly the compounds are important, but if you eat these leaves right and several other parts of the uh, these plants right they are uh, used for say potential drugs. So, they, do, they get the powders made from willow bark for example right useful for the treating headaches, pains, fevers and so on in the earlier days. Then they try to get what are the active ingredients if you eat some of the leaves right can be medicinal, but what are the active compounds which want to interact with the, with the, with the uh, system right. Then they found the 1980s they found that this is a close analog right then that became aspirin in 1899 right. So, they found that that is a chemical compound that is present right uh, in these plants right this is close to the aspirin in 1989. Because of the birth of the structure biology then the when you get the protein structures which structure first they, they determine the structure which protein insulin and that is for the sequence and for the structure that the hemoglobin myoglobin that they call the structures and got the Nobel price right. So, when we got the structures then we know the ligands which are working well as a drugs then they use the structural biology right and then they see which ligands and how they fit with the structures. This gave this the structure based uh, drug design right. So, we see given the 3D structure of any enzyme right you can use a structure based drug design right where the, ins the inhibitor can target right in a particular protein. For example, in this figure ok here if you see this is the protein and this is the ligand right how this ligand can fit with the protein right mainly the shape complementarity and kind of the lock and key mechanism how they will uh, interact right uh, and see how the activity changes fine. So, I show an example. So, here left hand side this is the database of uh, small molecules right there are many databases available for small molecules for example. 
a PubCom, you have Zinc database, a Chinese medicine, Xenomine database, right? There are many databases. Likewise, for different uh, diseases, for example, chikungunya or dengue, right? Recently, this is uh, going on, and many other viruses, right? So, like, there are several proteins which are involved, right, in these diseases, right? For example, RNA dependent RNA polymerase, right, for the case of the dengue. So, in this case, you can have the targets. So, now the question is if you have the database of small molecules and we know the target right then how to identify the lead compounds which can fit with this target and this could be useful as to design or get a drug molecule right. So, we try to use different uh, compounds and in this case we use computer drug design. So, there are various aspects like docking, screening, QSCR I will explain the details. So, using this information they will see some molecules. So, this can be a drug and other case this is not drug right. Also the drug likeliness depends upon the, the molecule weight, hydrogen donors, acceptors as well as it should pass other trials right toxicity as well as the side effects right it should pass all the clinical trials. So, using bioinformatics right we can scan millions of compounds quickly we can scan millions of compounds and then can, we can provide the information that okay these are the potential compounds right which could be used for the screening right and then from that screening we can identify the compounds we can reduce enormously and see this this can be used right for the further experiments right to see the activity as well as for the, uh, other different ex, ex, uh, animal studies. So, if you want to carry out computer aided drug design or structure based drug design. So, what are the features what are the in input information we require right if you, there are two different aspects one we need structure one is a ligand. If the structure is known and the ligand is also known then can we do this? We can do that right if you know the, the ACC here the known structure right and here the known ligand right then you can see these ligands can interact to this protein right you can see the docking and see whether this ligand will fit right with the particular protein right and this could be a probable lead compound or not. Now, the second question is if we know the protein structure and we do not know the ligand can we use structure based drug design? We can do right because we have a set of libraries for the ligands, protein structure is known. So, we can screen all these small molecules with respect to the protein and then we can see ok these, these are the probable compounds right which could be a lead compounds right. It is a kind of the needle in a haystack to finding this one uh, uh, structure from a set of structures right we have full of uh, uh, small molecules and from that Compo uh, the set we have to identify the probable compounds. And the next option is we know the ligand, but we do not know the protein structure. In this case, can we use a, the computer drug design? Right? If protein is structure is not known, but ling ligands are known. In this case, if we unknown the protein structure, can we predict the protein structure? Yes, right. We discussed about various uh, uh, types of uh, modeling. What are different types of uh, methods to get the protein modeling? Homology modeling, abinitio, pole recognition, and the hybrid methods, right? So, if we don't know the structure, we can get the structure, right? And the structures are known, then we can try to interact with the ligand, and we can uh, do that. But if structures are not known, ligand sets are not known, then can we do, right? But we can do cat, but that is not accurate. But it will give mainly wrong results. In this case, cat cannot be used, right? Because we we need at least some sort of experimental data, right? Without any experimental information, right? We can get some models, but the models are not reliable. In this case, we cannot trust this uh, computer drug design to get the probable lead compounds. Fine. So we look into the drug discovery. So right, if you want to have a drug. Normally, how many years it will take to get a new drug? It is almost about 10 years or 10 to 15 years it will take right from the lead compound and then do all these experiments get the activities then the animal studies then you have to do with the several clinical trials right phase 1, phase 2, phase 3. Then finally, if you go with the several million compounds ended up one or two compounds right as a potential drug, but they involves lot of time right and also lot of efforts we need and it also involves lot of money right because it is very expensive. So, to do all these uh, trials. 
So, we start everything from this experiment, they do the wet lab experiment from the beginning, then it involves lot of time right, it is a big uh, uh, process. So, to reduce the samples, to reduce the probable potential compounds right, we can use the computer modeling right. So, to see our screen the probable compounds which could be act as lead compounds. For example, we have the chemicals say ligands with the biological system right, we interact with the different uh, types of the proteins right and whether we give the desired response or not right, it should work right, but it should not give any side effects right and should not give any toxicity, it should not be toxic. So, whether we can give, so we uh, bioinformatics can do right to identify the initial set of compounds at least right, we can uh, identify these lead compounds. So, now we have the protein and we have the ligand right, how to do the docking, before doing docking so we need to prepare the protein, also we need to prepare the ligand right, because there will be a lot of issues in the case of proteins as well as the ligands right, so we have to work on that. So, let, let, let me explain what are the various options, so how to get the PDB structures from X-ray crystallography? So, we will get the direct structure from uh, X-ray crystallography? No, we do not get right, we do not get the structures, what will we get? Uh, map. map, we will get the electron density map, from the electron density map we derive the structures, but how accurate the structures from the electron density map? If the map is not clear, then the resolution is very low, in this case we are not sure about the atomic positions of this all the atoms right. So, then second case the water molecules. Right, sometimes they put lot of water molecules right to crystallize and to solve the structures right. So, in the case of the, the protein preparation right, so we some we, if the water molecules are important we keep the water molecule, if the water molecules are not important for the ligand to interact then in this case you can uh, remove water molecules. Second thing is most of the PDB structures if you see the hydrogen atoms are missing mainly in the case of X-ray structures. If you see the NMR structures, you can see the hydrogen atoms, but if you look into the X-ray structures, most of the structures the hydrogen atoms are missing. So, in this case, you have to add the hydrogen atoms, right, with the, all the missing atoms because most of docking programs require the explicit hydrogens. Why do you need explicit hydrogen? At least for getting these hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds are very important. So, in this case, we need this hydrogen to see the explicitly where we can uh, have these hydrogen bonds. So, we require the hydrogen, hydrogen atoms, we can add hydrogen bonds, but so many cases we can add for example, the CH3 group. So, 3 hydrogen, 2 or 3 hydrogens we can see the positions we can add easily, but if you say the case of the acidic and basic side chains, the question is whether this is charged or it is neutral. So, there is a confusion, this ambiguity, so adding all these things. So, then the main aspect is if you incorrectly assign the protonation states, then it will give the Four results. Well, the active sites when the ligand interacts with the uh, protein, so you have to assign the exactly protonate site. For example, if you take the glutamic acid or aspartic acid, either we can get CO minus or CO H, but they are the same or different? They are different, right? Here, if you see the CO H, this OH is higher than one donor, but this is not, right? So, we need to be careful to assign all these protonate states at the active sites right, because that is the place where the ligand can interact. Then if you take the histidine right, it is a base right and it is a neutral form right, it has either the base right, it is a positive charge or neutral form it has two tautomers right. In this case we have to check which one is the preferred ones for the ligand to interact. So, what is the tautomers? These are the isomers of organic compounds right, they interconvert the chemical reaction right for example, from the keto to enol due to the, uh, the migration of a hydrogen atom or proton right from the single bond and adjacent double bond. See here this H this is CO this is keto group, so if this protonation is happen here then finally, this C this single bond is OH this is called the keto enol tautomerism right. So, what is the isomers? Right, they have the same chemical formula, but different chemical structures right. So, now we need to consider mainly about these tautomers specifically in the case of uh, uh, this histidines and the uh, conversion of one for one for chemical group to another chemical group. 
So now the next aspect is as I discussed earlier, the crystallography gives electron density, but not the structure, right? In poorly resolved crystal structures, it's very difficult. For example, see the asparagine or the glutamine. Here, NGC is down, but this O is up. It's also possible the other way around, right? If you change the conformation, then the ligand also the interaction will be different, right? Because if the ligand we get one pose, with the oxygen is this side, it will have different interactions. If the other side, it will have different interactions, right? So, this orientation that is important. Then we have the uh, we need to flip the amide or imidazole. So, mainly in the case of the histidines also, we need to see where are these nitrogens. Then, how to decide which one is the best, right? So, we can decide based on the structures with ligands. If you see the PDB, several structures you can give free structures. Also, many cases you have the structures with ligands. With the ligands, you can look at the structures and see what are the probable orientations, probable conformation, and what are the probability of having this histidines, right, and which state. <coughs> then look into this information and then you can decide. For example, in your case, okay, this could be the most optimal one. Fine. So, if you go to the protein side, is fine, then go to the ligand side. Ligand side also, we need to have a probable 3D structure, right. Because the docking mainly bond length bond angle will not change much, so they are they do not consider this. But the torsion angles are important, right? So, the torsion angles are important that will give you the uh, rotation around the di different atoms. So, here also you have to see the potential state and the tautomeric form, right? This will change or influence the hydrogen bonding ability whether they say the strong bonds or the tight bonds or it is loose. So, here also you see the protonic state, right? Either use a physiological pH and use single atomer or use all possible protein states and then look at the lowest one at the highest score then take that for the uh, further processing. So, that you can do right. So, now you have the protein we analyze the protein and prepare the protein then we have the ligand ligand also we have chose the conformation ligand right then what we can do then we start docking 